What's up, everybody? This, I wanted to get out as quickly as possible. It may be a little hectic. It may be a little all over the place. Not a lot of like preparation and thought went into it. But as soon as I saw this morning's discussions in court in the take care of Maya verdict watch and while the jury is deliberating, the lawyers are still discussing things about punitive damages. And oh boy, some surprises for me that I did not know was happening in this case. Again, based on the claims for which they are asking for punitive damages, the battery and the false imprisonment, they are trying to bust these caps. And what busting the caps means, it could have multiple definitions, I guess, but what it means in Florida is going above and beyond the damages caps that Florida has set. It is very unusual. Um, it is only in the most extreme of circumstances. And we're going to look at that Florida statute today, but I want to listen to first the lawyers discuss it and argue about it in court. Then we'll apply the law and see if you guys think we're going to get there and why they're wanting to ask these additional questions to the jury, these very specific questions, why they are so important. Let's get to the video now. We're going to discuss this together and hopefully you guys learn something. Hopefully this answers some of your questions because I've had a bunch of questions pouring in about, oh, I thought the cap was three times compensatory damages um, or $500,000. And that is the cap for the vast majority of cases. That is the rule, but there are, as in many different legal areas, exceptions to that rule. And we are going to look at those exceptions today as quickly as we can, because I know I've heard the jury is dressed up to the nines and a lot of people are thinking a verdict is coming today, me included. I thought it was going to be this week. And since there's no Friday, that only leaves today. It's probably going to come sooner rather than later, probably before lunch. That's my guess, but I don't know. I think it's going to come today. And they want to go right into the punitive phase. So let's listen to what happened in court. And I'll give you some explanations as to where this could be going. And we could be looking at more than three times the compensatory damages awarded in this case for Maya for punitive damages. Um, and as soon as the jury gets here, I'll let you know. It should be here momentarily. Um, let's talk. Well, first off, do you all have any issues before we jump into talking about the potential punitive damage and what we're going to do and instructions and things like that? I was emailed to Mr. Hunter this morning. Nick Whitney had requested the two boxes that you brought in, I think, Monday morning. He wanted to go through them today. Oh, the production. Oh, I've been seeing them. Okay. I'll, I'll get with you guys. Okay. I, I received, uh, well, is there anything else before we talk about? Not yet. Not behalf of mine. Thanks. Um, I, I received, uh, and I guess Mr. Elliott received as well, Mr. Altenburn. Uh, revised verdict form that um, removes that second question. Yeah, I was wrong. Um, let's talk, though, about the verdict form plus the uh, jury instruction. Of course, all of this is making the assumption that there is one or more findings of punitive conduct. Obviously, if the jury comes back with no finding of punitive conduct, then there's no need to have um, all of this. But I don't want to not be. We've already talked about that. They have to come back clear and convincing evidence of punitive conduct on you know the battery or the false imprisonment. And if they do, then we go into a punitive phase where we talk about how bad it was and how much money they should give for that punitive conduct to punish the defendant appropriately and to deter them from acting like this in the future. That's the purpose of punitive damages. Prepared. So, Mr. Elegant, did you see Mr. Altenburn's language on the jury instructions? And I, I haven't heard a position yet articulated from the plaintiff as to that yeah, like, Your Honor, I think I think we have a set of instructions and a verdict form that I don't think have been forwarded to you. And I think we've had a little I'm up in Orlando because I've got a six district argument starting at 10. And so I think we had a little gap yesterday. But I've um, I had emailed with, uh, with Ms. Lawrence and the team this morning about trying to get that over to you. Uh, I don't I haven't looked at my email lately, so I don't know if it's going to. But our verdict form, I think, will look the same, except it adds the question for whether there was there's a subpart. C. I think it is that one can break the cap if there was an intent to harm. And we add that question for each of the uh, for each of the potential torts. And, uh, so it seems like at the 11th hour, the plaintiffs are trying to add an additional question for a specific finding that this should go above the caps because there was specific intent. Let's keep listening and then we're going to look at the statute and then we'll come back to the video. Punitive torts, obviously, as you observed earlier, those any findings that weren't sufficient to trigger those questions would drop out. But we, we thought we should have that in there. I understand the defense position to be that there's not sufficient evidence, we would say there is, the jury could infer or deduce from what they've heard there was a plan to drive a wedge, to break the family and so forth. Uh, and, and so we think that question should be on there. Uh, it may be moved. It and some be. of that specific intent was to drive a wedge in the family. Okay. Tracking, but we'll talk about whether or not we think that rises to that level. Be that the jury doesn't award, may not award any damages for one or, one or more. They may award uh, something that's not above the cap. 
uh, or they may answer that question, no. But if they award damages above the cap and the question's not there, <laughs> then we've gone eight weeks <laughs> and don't have an answer to that question. So as we talked about before, the jury, they can award. Let's say they get $100 million just to make the math easy, and the normal punitive damage cap applies in Florida, which is $500,000 or three times compensatory damages. They could give $300 million in, in punitive damages for a total verdict of $400 million. However, if they give $100 million in um, compensatory damages and a billion in punitive damages, well, then they're going to reduce it to that three times compensatory damages. That's what the judge will do after the verdict. However, I didn't realize they are looking to be the exception to the rule. And in order to be the exception to the rule, you have to have additional findings from the jury. So now is probably a good time to bring up the statute. Let's take a look at it. Make sure it's on your screen. You might be able to read it. You might not. I'm going to be here to read it for you. Punitive damages, limitations, except as provided in paragraph B and C, except as provided. An award of punitive damages may not exceed the greater of three times compensatory damages awarded to each claimant entitled thereto, consistent with the remaining provisions of the section, or $500,000. So 3x compensatory or $500,000. However, there are a couple exceptions to this rule. First, B, where the fact finder determines, and that's the important part about why we need a question to this jury. The fact finder must make a determination in order for them to bust the caps. So the fact finder determines that the wrongful conduct proven under this section was motivated solely by unreasonable financial gain. So we have some cases like that where, you know, big pharma, for instance, they maybe, you know, didn't before there were warnings, let's say on pill bottles and before there were seat belts and things like that, that was too expensive to do. If they lied to the general population about this stuff and they did it for financial gain, that would be under this section. I don't necessarily think we have that here. I know they build 500 grand for CRPS treatments, but that's unfortunately not unreasonable for 90 days being in the hospital. Now, if it was fraudulent billing, that's different, but did they really do all this for financial gain? I would say that's a tough one, but that's one of the ways you can bust the punitive damages cap um, and determines that the unreasonably dangerous nature of the conduct, together with the high likelihood of injury resulting from the conduct, was actually known by the managing agent, director, officer, or other person responsible for making policy decisions on behalf of the defendant. So we know that they were trying to make that connection with the managers and the directors and the officers. However, there's an and there in the middle of paragraph two. Whoops, I missed it. And. So it has to be for unreasonable financial gain and this stuff. That's really tough to me. But if they get that done, instead of being three times compensatory damages, now it goes up to four times compensatory damages. And so that would mean instead of if they give $100 million, instead of giving $300 million, they could give $400 million. Okay. Uh, or the sum of $2 million. So instead of 500K being the cap, 200 or 2 million, but again, the three or four times compensatory damages is the larger number that we're talking about at this point. Okay. Or this exception, which is I think what they're actually going for at this point, not seeing the documents makes this a little difficult. I haven't read the complaint. I haven't read the amended complaints, which I'm sure there were multiple ones, but see where the fact finder, again, which is the jury in this situation, determines that at the time of injury, the defendant had a specific intent to harm the claimant and determines that the defendant's conduct did in fact harm the claimant, there shall be no cap on punitive damages. So I will just tell you, I have never had a case that I have tried and gotten a specific intent finding by the jury to bust the cap all together and remove the cap. That means if they give a billion dollars in punitive damages, guess what? A billion dollars will be the verdict. They will not reduce it down for any cap. So why do they want a jury question here about specific intent? Well, let's say again, the jury gives a hundred million for compensatory and a billion for punitive. If they don't have that specific intent, the plaintiffs are going to argue judge. They clearly found that this was the worst of the worst. They found specific intent for Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Johns Hopkins is going to say, no way, judge. They didn't find specific intent. They just hated us because of the IJ and they thought we were grossly negligent and they didn't find any specific intent that we did anything to harm her specifically by putting her on somebody's lap 
or by, you know, keeping her in the hospital, which we really think DCF did. And they would argue about it. And without these specific jury interrogatories or jury questions to answer, it's difficult for the judge to really know what the jury found and what they determined. So how do you fix that? You put a specific question in. Do they find specific intent in order to bust the cap? And if they find yes, we don't have to argue about it. Now, other arguments are preserved. The defense can say, which I think is coming up, they didn't plead this appropriately. They didn't put this in their complaint. They didn't put this in the causes of action that carry with it punitive damages, judge. We could have changed the way we argued the case. Let's listen to some of that argument now and we'll continue to discuss it. But take another look at this and just remember, this is what they are trying to prove, specific intent to harm this claimant. And they did harm her, therefore no caps. This was just really wild and interesting and a legal thing that just really does not come up that much um, in my home state of Florida. So I thought it would be cool to do a video, explain this to you guys. I know you're going to have these questions. You guys always have questions like this. So I wanted to get it out as short uh, of a video as I could for you to get the information and as quickly as I could get it done. And so you want to have a question that that essentially uh, eliminates the caps for punitive damages. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, it, it, it would, the jury would answer the question. And if they answered yes, then there wouldn't be a cap on that particular award for that subsection. If they answer uh, yeah, that, that's what would happen. But it would be it would have to be for each one, I think. Uh, I mean, to be fair uh, to the to, to both sides, because you know, the defense wouldn't want one question. You know, if, I'm, I'm sure the defense, if it's going to be on there, I'm sure they would want it separated, separated like that. Uh, and we have a form with that, and I don't know uh, if that could be forwarded to. I mean, well, I think it has to legally be separated so that they can find specific intent for that claim. Mr. Altenburn has seen it, uh, but I don't think it's been sent to the court yet. Your Honor, I have a hard copy with me, and I can give you a one-page sample of the question you're talking about. If you'd like well, that, that would be great if I can have that, but also if we could get the uh, electronic uh, forwarded as well. And as a preview, Mr. Altenburn, what's obviously I think the answer is you don't want it on there. And yeah, that, it wasn't and he's right. They're, they're attempting to do this to, to lift a cap. And we, I go back to the fact that they pled malicious, and they never pled anything about this or about a desire to beat a cap. I understand that the form that was given to me yesterday was actually prepared by the earlier consultants in August, but the first time I ever saw it was yesterday morning. So we're, we're getting an argument that they want to, to prove specific intent as to lift the cap at the very close of this case when the jury's already out. So, I, so they I said they didn't plead it. They never wanted in anything before. Again, to be fair, the punitives part hasn't started yet, and this would be part of the punitives portion of the trial. Um, but again, a good argument from the defense too. Maybe it would have changed the way they argued. They still can make arguments, of course, on the punitive section, but... We're going to have an idea. If this jury comes back with a $5 million verdict, then, you know, the defense is not going to be that worried. If they come back with a $100 million, $200 million, $500 million verdict, the jury dressed up, are they going to dress up and really only give Maya a million dollars? I don't think so. I think they're going to make some noise with this verdict if I had to guess. Subjective on that, but particularly when you look at, you know, this the claim for punitive is for the false imprisonments and for the battery. And the notion that they proved that we had some specific intent to harm Mia Kowalski and Maya Kowalski and did the conduct. I mean, the fact that he called fact, her Mia Kowalski just tells you sometimes about what some of these defendants think and feel about these cases and how much they care about these people that have been seriously injured, but not going to waste time on that. That is actually a decent argument. Did they prove that they, the hospital specifically intended to harm Maya with those actions? Or did they prove they were in some sadistic way, thinking they were protecting her by cutting her off from her family. And again, that's something that the jury is going to have to specifically find. Let me know what you think in the comments. Do you think that there was specific intent on, the, on, the, on behalf of Johns Hopkins, All Children's Hospital, and their agents to harm Maya with the allegations of battery and false imprisonment specifically? Let me know in the comments. I want to hear from you. You are the potential jurors. I harm Maya Kowalski. I don't think that the evidence is there on that. To, to do that. Frankly, it's always been confusing to me, by the way, whether you lift the cap by clear and convincing or, or by greater weight of the evidence. This is put on a form where it would be greater weight of the evidence. But one way or the other, I do not believe that it's appropriate to give that question. Well, let me ask this. The question of the, the cap issue is something I effectively deal with post-judgment, assuming we ever get them. Correct. The statute requires findings, fa fact findings by the find findings by the finder of fact is what it says in the statute. So why is it not better for us to put the questions in there, see what the jury does? And then if there's a question of it wasn't properly pled, I can always deal with it after the fact. And I, I think I understand. It's on 1.5 speed. He isn't losing his mind. He probably is a little nervous about this because this is bad for the defendant because um, it takes away an argument that they didn't have a specific finding, which would be a pretty strong argument. The judge is absolutely correct. I think it should be in there. 
let them answer it. And guess what? If the plaintiff did something wrong, didn't plead it in time, it was unfair or it prejudiced the defense at the timing of bringing this up. They waived it because they didn't bring it up sooner. Guess what? The judge can deal with that on the back end and make a legal determination of that. But we're not going to have this jury here again to find, to be the fact finder and make this determination. We have them here now. It's been nine weeks. Let them make this determination. And guess what? If we did something wrong as the plaintiff, the judge can deal with it later. That's absolutely the appropriate way to handle this. Precisely that the defense is saying it should not be on there in the first instance at all because it wasn't pled we, and, and have no formal notice. Like, if we had known that they were going to try to beat the cap, I, I thought maybe they would try to do that on child abuse when they put in the, the language on sex battery that got stricken. But I, I frankly was not anticipating that, that they were going to do this. And this is, these are things that would have impacted how we presented the case. So or I potentially, I actually think they would have been able to have a better argument if they put it if they pled punitives on the intentional infliction of emotional distress. But I also don't think this is improved. And well, the. I mean, certainly there's a portion of this case that we would have to have. Also, he, him not thinking that it's been proven doesn't matter. Me not thinking that it's been proven or thinking that it's been proven doesn't matter. What matters is, does the jury think that it's been proven? And that's who we have to ask. And that's why I'm asking you. If there were a <coughs> finding of punitive damages in, in phase one. So it's, I mean, the defense would still have an opportunity to present evidence. Yeah, but the notion, you know, using, for example... It, so again, while it is a good argument that they weren't able to present evidence on this during the case in chief, they will be able to during the punitives portion. EEG room that we had a specific intent to harm her by moving her down the hall to, to go into that room. Is there really evidence of that? And uh, again, I hear the argument that he's making, but the judge is not the finder of fact here. Make that exact argument, sir, to the jury. You should be able to convince them. If you think there was no evidence, there's no way they proved it. You should be able to convince them that there was not a specific finding, or a, a finding or a determination that they specifically intended to hurt Maya and did hurt Maya. If you think it's so obvious, argue it to the jury. Tell it to the judge, as my mom used to say. Well, my, my inclination is to put the questions on there, and then if we ever get there, deal with whether um, this was properly pled later. Absolutely I, I mean, the I mean, right call. No surprise. Um, absolutely the right call. Why not? Do it now as opposed to not knowing the answer to the question later. I, I, I would hate to have to just do the whole thing over because we didn't ask the question of the jury. And if it doesn't effectively change anything as, as it relates to what we're asking the jury to do, then I'd rather just ask the questions. I think that's consistent with my approach to the entire case. So I want to do that. Now, how about the actual jury instruction language? Is there agreement on what Mr. Alton Burns sent around? Are there additional items that need to be addressed? And, and certainly I need to see it sooner as opposed to later. Uh, hey, Nick, are you know? I, let me get, I think we would need to uh, obviously have a question. That, or maybe we don't. Maybe we don't need to start. Maybe that's a parent question. But, um, the, these, not, I don't have Mr. Yeah, these instructions do not include. I don't. I, I, I think there's something that needs to be added if you're going to put the specific intent question on this, because I used language from the standard instruction in A and B. I think maybe that is in C or D. I've got I've got the form here. I can look. The jury is here now. But one way or the other, it, it may be missing some factor for that. Well, Mr. Alligate, I know you said you have an oral argument in front of the District Court of Appeal this morning. Is one of your law partners able to pick this up? Because I really need this language sooner as opposed to later. Yes, I, I, and we have sent a set. I, I, I can't, since I'm on my phone, I can't call up the set and, and, and see what's going on at the same time. Maybe Mr. Altmark, the set that we sent the other day, does it have the, the, the instruction in it about intent? I, I don't, I can't get it in front of me right now. Well, let's put it, we don't need to, Your Honor, yes, we'll look at, we, we have other folks that can look at this and 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 uh, uh, Ms. Lawrence and the team have, have a copy of what was done yesterday or the day before, and so they can also look at that and forward it to the court. Okay. Sooner as opposed to later, please. Thank you. Now, yes. um, and, and Mr. I'll get Mr. Altenburn. I did, and I don't know if this was intentional or just as we're going through the form. I didn't see the standard instruction that says you may, in your discretion, decline to assess punitive damages. Maybe I just misread it, but was that something that we need to put in the? It's, it's, Your Honor, that's, so go ahead, so Mr. That, that's in that, that instruction is in the phase one that you've already given, I think. And then the way they deal with it in phase two, and it's a little, I will, I will agree, it's a little tricky the way they have it worded in the official or in the standard verdict. But there's a when you get to phase two, the way it's worded, uh, it talks about. That you may have punitive, you know, side amount of punitive damages, comma, if any. So the if any. if any removes the portion to not say you don't have to put any because it puts it all in one. It's simpler. It's less questions. Usually that's how it's done. Any that's in, the, in each of those questions takes care of it. Well, but I, I would tell you, though, that that language is a standard within the opening instruction second stage portion. Oh, okay. So, okay, okay, I thought you were talking about the verdict form. I'm sorry. No, no, on the actual language. So it, it's under the little section that says refer to note eight on, or sorry, refer to note on use eight. So maybe I can just look at that and if it needs to be added in there 
And then also, do we need a non-duplication instruction? Maybe it will be mooted mm -hmm. out by what happens Right. I put a non-duplication on the verdict form, but I didn't put it in the instruction. And, and I, I will tell you, my, I am leaning, and I certainly would, would listen to both sides, but I am leaning um, I am leaning towards if the jury finds both battery as it relates to the photography session and false imprisonment as it relates to the photography session to combine those as a punitive damage for that issue. I mean, that's how I'm leaning right this second. I think that kind of obviates the non-duplication issue, but... The defense would not object to that. I, I didn't think and so we talked about how specific punitive damages for specific events, they would put the battery and false imprisonment. So there are multiple incidents that could be considered battery or false imprisonment, but he would put them together. Um, the photography holding her down, that type of stuff would be only one amount of punitive damage would be allowed there. So again, when we're talking about the caps, but if there's no caps, probably doesn't really matter. I think it would, but uh, just to let you know, that's where I'm leaning. So um, I'm going to turn that back over to the lawyers to get uh, those, uh, documents to me as soon as possible. I understand we have the uh, jury here. So are there any issues we need to address before we let the jury start to begin their deliberations? No, you're right. Right. Let's bring in the uh, jury. And Madam Clerk, if you can please uh, take the evidence. All right. Let's... I want to confirm while you we go. members of the discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation. You received no information. Is that all correct? correct. And that's obviously since we, we broke yesterday from your deliberations. Is that correct? correct. Okay. And has anyone approached you at all about this case? No. Have any of you seen any media accounts uh, about this case? No. Okay. I've just asked the clerk to go re-deliver the evidence to you. I just heard the door close. So they're in the process of doing that. Um, let's talk logistics for a moment. Uh, Timing-wise, you all are whatever you all do is, is going to be fine from a timing perspective. Remember, if, if you wish to continue to deliberate after today, we'll have to bring you back on Monday. The courthouse is closed in honor of Veterans Day tomorrow. So um, if we're not finished with our work, we're going to bring you back next week. Okay. I, um, you want to have any questions about that? He's, concerns, like, or anything like that? he's like, I really don't want to. I know you probably don't want to, but he didn't say it. He's like, okay. Anybody have any questions? Okay. Um, what I'm going to do is I have the sealed, uh, envelope. It does not look like it has been um, damaged in any way. Do the attorneys wish to look at the seal or anything like that? Sure. No, okay, I'm going to hand the, uh, the sealed package back to the uh, jury, and we're going to let you recommence your deliberations, and we will uh, await your question or verdict. Okay, you may begin deliberating. All right. Your second thing. Thank you. Uh, the juries of our presence, please be seated. Obviously, we don't know from a timing perspective what's going to occur. I would ask if you leave campus, try not to go too far so that when we have a question or a verdict, we can uh, reassemble. Uh, I've got other things I'm working on this morning, but I will, you know, we, as soon as we hear, I'll try to wrap up whatever I'm doing at that moment and come and address this uh, case here. Any questions? Sir, if you, if you want me to, I can go back to my. My, my office away from my office and, and, and add that paragraph. I've been working on the graph of the landscape. I mean, I, it's missing, and I can take a look to see if there's information that needs to be added for this specific. Yeah, it might just be a sentence, whatever, you, Mr. Altenburg, you want to do. Um, I just, and maybe the lawyers need to have their witnesses for punitive damages available and ready to go because we're, from a timing perspective, if we're trying to land this today, if there's a finding of punitive that we have to go into uh, phase two, I'd like to be able to turn it as quickly as we possibly can. Kind of makes me think the judge thinks there's going to be a verdict today. We can, um, but obviously it depends on when. Okay. We will be in recess pending the call of the jury. Okay. Thank you. All right. So that's it. I want to jump on, answer those questions. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. I don't think I said hit the like button, like the video, subscribe to the page. If we do have a verdict today, I'll be on later, not live, to discuss it, break it down with you. It's going to be complicated. It's going to be a long reading of the verdict. If they do punitives today, we'll talk about that too. Stay tuned. Hit that bell if you do subscribe. Thanks for being here with me. That's all I've got. I am out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who might be interested here on YouTube. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. You can also follow us on all social media, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, at Lawyer You Know. But on Instagram, we are still at Tragos Law. So look us up on there. And don't forget to listen to The Lawyer You Know podcast available on all major podcast platforms. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, 
If it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us lawyer, you know, at gmail.com. Of course, all of these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, the lawyer, you know.